up here today. And I want to say hi, obviously, to all of our in-person audience and to those of you watching online. Special thank, special hello today to my dear wife, who is usually always here when her husband preaches. This is not a sl slam on her husband. She has Mo's surgery coming up on Tuesday, so she's on quarantine. And so, Joey, a special hello to you, honey, and uh, certainly praying for you. But um, it's a blessing to be able to share today as we look to continue to move forward in the issue of this whole series. During pa pa week one, Pastor Dan spoke about the will of God crisis. Last week, he spoke about God being more concerned about our sanctification than he is about directing every single little decision that we make. Today, we're going to look at the importance of GPS. How many of you have a GPS system that you use on your phone? Those of you remember back when we used Garmin's and all that? Well, for me, they're very important because it helps me not to get lost nearly as often. But we're going to look today at God's priority system, GPS, in helping us to walk in the way of wisdom. If you have the North Central app, you can go to this weekend, and you can go to message notes if you're a note taker, and you'll find an outline of the message, and you can then insert things in there as we go today, and that'll make it a little bit easier for you to recall some of what's shared today. Hopefully today's message will not just give you some how-tos, but hopefully it'll give you some inspiration, some encouragement, and some key guiding principles for making decisions by using GPS, God's priority system so that we really walk in the way of his wisdom. Research tells us that decision fatigue is a real thing, that some of the people I was reading and doing some research said that we make up to 35,000 decisions a day. To be honest, when I first read that number, I said, come on, you've got to be kidding me, 35,000 decisions a day, there's no way that there's that much time. But then as I began thinking about all the different decisions I make each day, I began to realize that it may or may not be 35,000, but it's a big number. It's a big number that we deal with in terms of decisions. In fact, I thought I might have made that many decisions just about this sermon. And you'll be glad that the other 10 pages I had, I've gotten rid of, so we won't be here for three days. That's a, that's a blessing for all of you. Whether or not you think that number is too high, the truth is that we are all faced with many, many decisions each day. One person said, no matter what the exact number is, we might as well pay attention to them because, as John Maxwell famously put it, life is a matter of choice, and every choice you make makes you. Choices make a difference. Let's start with a quick quiz and honesty test. Remember, God knows all, so you might just as well be honest, because if you're not, he'll know. Um, how many of you really yourself wrestle with making decisions? How many of you sometimes are the people that make very quick decisions and then sometimes go, whoops, that was maybe not the best decision? You know, we can have paralysis of analysis and just not get off and get going, or we can be at the other end where we just move quickly and go forward. When you think about the big decisions, we, we think that there's a lot of, um, you know, there's, there's so many things in terms of where you're going to live and what you're going to do and all those kinds of things. Um, but then there's also a lot of little decisions, like when to get up, when to go to bed, what to eat, where to shop, what do you want to watch on TV, what kind of cell phone do you buy, do you buy a car, do you lease a car? My wife would say that I can suffer from paralysis of analysis with picking out a Hallmark card in the, in the card shop. You know, I could spend weeks just reading through all the cards, and if one gets me to cry, then that's the card, that's the time to do it. Also, being the SU nut I am, there's one SU for the message today, but being the SU nut I am, and I would have mentioned it a lot more if they'd won yesterday, but it's just been a kind of a tough season. But um, with a closet full of SU stuff at home, sometimes just deciding what SU garment I'm going to pull out that day to wear can be another tough choice for someone like myself. How many of you have ever thought this? Sometimes I wish God would just tell me what to do. You know, you're praying, you're looking for God's wisdom, and it's just like, Lord, please just tell me. I, I want to please you, but I'd like to be sure. Which sometimes can then get us into that fear of making a decision because we're afraid we haven't heard directly from him. The Oxford English Dictionary says the capacity of judging rightly in relating, matters relating to life and conduct is wisdom. It also says soundness of judgment in the choice of means and ends. Sometimes less strictly, looks at the idea of sound sense, especially in practical affairs, as opposed to folly. 
Many look to philosophers, they look to educators, they look to political leaders, they look to coaches. They look today, you might be podcasts, it might be influencers, it may be many with great knowledge of technology that we turn to and look to. We may look to others who've been very successful in life as our people for wisdom. But our big idea today is that God's will is clear, that we seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and we become more like Christ which means we can make decisions out of our desire to love him. We're going to look at some scriptures from Proverbs in a minute, but did you know that God has a Twitter account? It's the book of Proverbs. How many of you really love the book of Proverbs? I know I do. There's such intensely practical information throughout that book. It teaches us successful living in so many different areas. Things like wisdom and folly, the righteous and the wicked, the tongue, pride and humility, justice and vengeance, family, laziness and work, poverty and wealth, friends and neighbors, love and lust, life and death, all talked about in many more in the book of Proverbs. It touches upon every facet of human life and relationships and its principles, and part of what amazes me, shouldn't because it's God's word, but it transcends the bounds of time and culture. It's just as relevant today as it was when it was first penned. Robert Morgan said, think of the book of Proverbs as God's Twitter feed to the human race. God's giving advice to us in short bursts of communication, usually 140 characters or less. It is God's divinely designed self-improvement course. What a great course for us to follow. Think of Proverbs is that portable wisdom, heavenly rules for earthly living. Each of the Proverbs either tells us how we'll respond to life if we have a healthy fear of the Lord, or how we'll mess up if we don't have that appropriate healthy fear that he talks about a great deal in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs states its theme very explicitly early in the book, and we're going to look at some scriptures that will help us through there. But, you know, one of the things that sometimes can be a real misconception of people is what is the idea of fear of the Lord? Robert Morgan says that, you know, it's not unhealthy, it's not dysfunctional, it's not debilitating fear, it's an appropriate respect, it's reverence, it's awe, it's wonder. We're just amazed at our God. We're in love with our God. We just have this awesome, amazing God that we can turn to, and he loves us. The fear of the Lord refers to us viewing him as he deserves. Viewing him as he deserves. It means living our lives in light of what we know of him. It means holding him in high esteem. It means depending on him with humble trust. Only then, Proverbs teaches, will we really discover knowledge and wisdom. A fool when we look at some of these scriptures, is not referring to someone that is a moron or an idiot, but rather to someone who does not choose to live life God's way. So fear of the Lord is indeed the foundation of true knowledge, but the fools despise that wisdom and discipline, Proverbs 1.7. Before I read the next scripture, I just want to briefly mention my little grandson, Ethan. He's now nine. He was born completely deaf, and at 10 months old, had cochlear implants done at NYU down in New York City. And when he was a little guy, he had to go four times a year to have his own ears tuned and checked to see if he was hearing what he should hear. And then it went to three, and now it's down to two. He was just down again end of December for another checkup so he could maximize how he hears and he's really hearing. Think about that a little bit as you listen to these scriptures from Proverbs 2. My child, listen to what I say. Listen to what I say. And treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Tune your ears. Listen. Treasure. Great words. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Then you'll understand what it means to fear the Lord, and you will gain the knowledge of God. For the Lord grants wisdom. 
from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. How important that we truly listen and then decide to act upon what God has for us. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Proverbs 9, verse 10. Note again, just to emphasize, this is not a shaking fear, but it's a reverential awe of our amazing God. It's like a child who fears disappointing his mom or dad. They don't want to lose that approval. It's a healthy fear. It's truly good for our spiritual health. Campbell Morgan wrote that there's two kinds of fear. The fear that God will hurt me, but that is a selfish fear. And the fear that I will hurt him. The fear that I will hurt him. And a fear founded in love in producing holiness and character and righteousness of conduct. Lord, how I want to live for you, how I want to be open to you, how I want to be transformed by you, how I want to be obedient to you. Help that be the case. The fear is God, as Tozer said, is astonished reverence. Isn't that great? Astonished reverence. I believe that the reverential fear of God mixed with love and fascination and astonishment and admiration and devotion is the most enjoyable state and the most satisfying emotion the human soul can know. I just love that. Astonished reverence. Stop thinking of all the things that God has done for you and in you and transformed you. There should be astonished reverence. So what is wisdom? We're going to look at a couple of things in terms of what wisdom is, some of the things we've been using from our supplemental book, Just Do Something. And we're going to look at some of those of you who like to fill in blanks. There'll be some information there to do. What is wisdom? It's understanding the fear of the Lord and it's finding the knowledge of God. It's understanding that fear of the Lord and it's finding the knowledge of our amazing God. In Proverbs, wisdom is always moral. So many moral choices that we make, character choices that we make and demonstrate. And then it's all about knowing God and doing as he commands. The more we fall in love with Jesus, the more we fall in love with our amazing God that we're just so amazed by and just that reverence awe, the more we desire to do as he commands. And biblical wisdom means living a disciplined and a prudent life in that healthy, healthy fear of the Lord, that reverential, awesome look at our God. I'm going to share a brief video of my grandson Ethan when he was three years old. And it demonstrates something that can be an issue for us, I think, or maybe it's just me that ever has this problem. But we'll go ahead and we'll just show that brief video. Stuck. Ethan. <laughs> what are you stuck in? I'm stuck in a wheelbarrow. Oh, no. <laughs> Say, Dad, you better come home and get me unstuck. <laughs> you better come home and get me unstuck. <laughs> I love you. I love you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you soon. I'm stuck. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do? Get unstuck, I hope. Well, I hope that we all get unstuck. I don't know about you, but when you get stuck, there's different reasons we can get stuck. And um, as we look to go forward, um, what are some of the reasons that we get stuck on our journey? What are some of the reasons that we get stuck? Have any of you ever missed a turn because you were distracted when you were driving the car? You're going somewhere else, and you're like, oh my goodness, what am I doing? I was supposed to get on 690 here. It certainly has happened to me. And there's a lot of things that can distract us. Um, one, one is health issues. During the pandemic, we've obviously had more health issues than ever before. But as someone who works with our Encore folks here at North Central, who are the 55 and olders, as someone who is getting very close to 70 myself and who's had 10 surgical procedures over the years, I know that health challenges can be things that can get us distracted. They can get us worn down. And those health challenges don't just happen to those as we age. They can obviously happen younger also and be a real impact on people in their lives. There can be financial issues that can distract us. 
There can be job issues, job decisions. Do I take this job? Do I go here? Do I stay there? What about this coaching position? Do I like this position better? What it might be? It can be marriage and relationship issues. It can be issues with our children. It can be aging parents. A number of our folks at North Central have been taking care of parents a great deal during this pandemic. That's a huge responsibility, and God bless them. But it then takes a lot of your time and energy. And it's a wonderful blessing to do it, but then it may pull you away from some other things also. Political, social issues, we certainly had no shortage of those in the last year. What's the second D word in terms of why we get lost or stuck? We're deceived. We're deceived and we're following the wrong map. Our own map is guiding us. We've got our ideas of what it should be, how it should work, and we're just wanting to follow what we believe is always correct and right. Proverbs says, fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1.7. Proverbs 3.7 says, be not wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and turn away from evil. And one other verse from Proverbs 26, verse 12. Do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for them. So be careful about being wise in your own eyes. You've got it all figured out. You know everything the way it should be. What others tell us can also be a problem when we get deceived. Who are you listening to? Are you listening to educators, politicians? Are you listening to podcasts? Are you listening to cable news? Are you listening to all these different noises? There's a lot of noise out there. Or are you earnestly seeking God for wisdom as you look to make wise decisions? We can obviously be deceived by another D word, the devil himself. Scripture is very clear that there's a spiritual warfare. Scripture is very clear that the enemy of our soul wishes to destroy us. He's like a mighty lion looking, seeking whom he can devour. So we need to be careful because he is the chief of liars, and he's very good at what he does. And his deception can lead us into a place where we get stuck or we go in a bad direction. Third, D, we delay because of over-spiritualizing, paralysis of analysis, fear of failure, fear of getting it wrong. If we don't make every perfect decision, we just don't move. It's very hard to steer a car if it never moves. It's very hard to make decisions if you just stay in one place forever. It's one thing to wait upon the Lord. He didn't say to wait there forever. So we need to be looking to what are some of the things that can cause issues there. Well, I mentioned before that decision fatigue is a real burden. One definition says it's an emotional and mental strain from a burden of choices. If you walked into Wegmans lately and even just wanted, you know, I got a sandwich, I just want to pick out a bag of chips. I get into the chips line. There's 400 different types of chips. What am I going to do? I'm stuck. I want to be like Ethan walking around with a wheelbarrow. I'm stuck. What did Joey want? She said, this, get this. And now there's 48 different types of that in the store. What do I get? Do I call my wife or do I take the risk of coming home with the wrong thing? What do you do? Decision fatigue both leads to two outcomes, either risky decision-making, like picking the wrong thing and bringing it home to Joe, or decision fatigue and avoidance, where we just stop trying to make certain decisions because we're just burdened. I love spending time with my four grandkids. It's one of the great blessings of life. For those of you who have grandkids, you know what a blessing that is. Um, and one of my favorite things is to hear Dalen or Della or Caleb or Ethan say something like this. My mommy or daddy did this. My mommy or daddy said that. They say to do it this way, Papa. We can't do it that way, Papa. My mommy, my daddy says. Well, recently I was with Ethan for of some time, and he's now nine, and he had just gotten back from a trip to NYU for his hearing check. And it was right after Christmas, so he was doing a lot of building of new Christmas things with his toys with his dad. They'd had all the Christmas decorations up, and he began to share with me, and I wish I had it on, on video, because he must have said 10, 12, 15 times over the course of a few minutes, my daddy said, my daddy did, my daddy this. I was starting to feel less and less like, Papa has no value here, but thank goodness daddy does. Daddy has value. That's a good thing. Let me say that both my daughters married really smart guys, and I'm just so blessed by Earl and by Dan, and they're, and they're bright guys. However, as smart as they are, as bright as they are, and extremely proud of them as I am, neither one of them are nearly as wise as our Lord. And, they, and like all of us, we fall short, obviously, of his glory. We, need, we know the need for him for as far as our sins, and then we know the need also for wisdom. So 
again, um, I think hopefully a good reminder for all of us. What if we as believers all came to our Abba, Daddy, Father, our Abba, Daddy, Father, like Ethan came to me talking about his dad? What if we all came thinking, I just, I just want to sit at his feet and learn from him. I just want to be like that little, like the word says, to come to him like a little child. I can't wait to get in his presence. I need more of Jesus. I want to sit and learn from him. I want to open his word. I want to spend time in prayer. I want to do that because I just love him. You know what I think sometimes unfortunately happens? We come to him more like teenagers. Teenagers who think they know more than mom and dad. Any of you remember those years when you were a teen? Any of you have a teenager now who thinks they know a lot more than you ever know? Thankfully, I can say this. When you get far enough down the journey, lots of times they begin to realize that you weren't as dumb as they thought when they were a teenager. But how we wish that we'd come like a little child with that faith. Abba, Daddy, teach me. I'm going to share three practical things that we should do. And as part of that discussion, I'm going to have as part of that a little personal case study that hopefully connects to say, well, like, all right, what, are you, what are you talking about, Rich? What do, you, what, do you, what do you mean here? So I'm going to give you a little quick backdrop to the story so hopefully as you hear the what we should do's, it makes more sense to you. Back in 1988, I was principal of Fayetteville Elementary School. It was in my third year. I'm headed towards tenure. It's a great district. There's great kids. There's great community. There's all kinds of parent support. There's good budget support. Our kids test really well in, in FM. And honestly, a million, I mean, all these principals around the county would have loved to be in the seat I was sitting in. They would have fought to get in that seat. I'm sitting there, and I, I had a great administrative team. I just loved, I mean, I know there was no one I didn't like on the team. It was a position that was really hard to even think about possibly leaving. But that fall, I went through a two-week period. We're in two weeks. We'd had six night meetings. We used to kid that FM sometimes stood for frequent meetings because we met a lot in Fayetteville Manlius. And so I was leaving Liverpool at 7 o'clock in the morning, driving to FM. I was there until 9, 9.30 at night. I'd drive home. It would be 10 o'clock. My kids were asleep when I left. My kids were asleep when I got home. And I was sitting there thinking, you know, this just isn't right. There's something about this. I'd gotten out of sales after a year, many years earlier, thinking that isn't the way I want to live my life as a dad. And so my girls were seven and nine at that time. They were in second grade and fourth grade. And I'm thinking, I'm, gonna, I'm just missing an awful lot. I, I just don't feel good about that. Well, step one we should take is we should walk in the way of wisdom by reading, studying, and meditating on Scripture. I happened to walk into that room upstairs, room 10, in the balcony, 1988, October. David Knapp was teaching a Sunday school class, and he's teaching really on God's priorities, even before there was GPS. And he's talking about, first priority is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then to love others as he loved us. And, and then he said he put up a list on the whiteboard, back in the days of whiteboards. I think we were past chalkboards. I could be wrong. But I think it was a whiteboard, if I remember correctly. Not a very good whiteboard either. It kind of was shaking all over. But David's putting the stuff up there, and he's saying, you know, God first, then if you're blessed to be married, your wife, your children, your extended family, your friends, and then your work and your recreation and other things that are of value that you need to do. And as I sat there, I was being convicted of something being out of balance in my own life at that time. As I sat there, I then began to really seek Scripture. Like, Lord, I want to make sure that like, I'm kind of in alignment with your word. And certainly his word in terms of what our priorities is pretty clear. And David was certainly right on with what he was teaching. Just a quick bonus thought. This is an extra, no extra charge. This is free for everybody today. One of my favorite preachers is Andy Stanley. I love listening to Andy teach for many, many years. But one of the things he says is that we've got to be careful about putting other things ahead of things that God has called you alone to do. For example, only I can be a husband to Joey. Only I can be a dad, what a blessing, to Kate and Kim. I can be one of two papas 
to my four beautiful grandchildren and try and bless them and teach them and just, just, just love on them as God would have me to. So be careful about putting other things ahead of things that only you can do for your kids or family. As we look at what we should do, God wants transformation. We talk about that all the time at North Central. Gospel transformation, that's the thing he wants for us. Scripture is very clear about the importance of our being transformed. He wants us to know him intimately. So he, his thoughts become our thoughts. His ways become our ways. His affections, our affections. Lord, may our affections for you grow in each and every one of us. What else should we do that's part of that process? He wants us to drink deeply of his word, that we love what he loves and we hate what he hates. This Tuesday will be my 38th birthday in Christ. Two weeks after I came, into, came to Jesus, I walked into what used to be just our small chapel up front. And the more I learn about him, the more I realize, holy smokes, he's so far beyond my thinking. His ways are but so much higher than my ways. And as much as I learn, I have so much more to learn, and there's so much wisdom from him. But I also realize that even though I still have all that additional stuff to learn, it doesn't keep me from loving what he loves and hating what he hates and just growing in that love for him and that love for others that God brings into my path. And so, dear brothers and sisters, Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and a holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he's done, all that he's done. It's, it's astounding what he's done for us. It's astounding. I may have thought back in the day that Carmelo Anthony did a lot for SU. I love when Carmelo was here and we got that national championship. But you know what? Carmelo was here for a year. That was great. Thank you, Carmelo, very much. But, you know, he's gone. He's gone. But the Lord has done all these things to us, for us. You know, um, when you look at the last part of that verse, and it says, but let God transform you into a new, new person by changing the way you think. Before I came to Jesus, I thought very differently. I had very different priorities. My focus was in all kinds of other places. It wasn't what would Jesus want me to do. It wasn't loving the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and strength. It just, it wasn't. I mean, I was much more worried about what SU was doing on the court, on the football field, on the lacrosse field, you name it. That was, that was a priority. You know, what Joey and I were doing, it was all about us and our kids. What was our next vacation going to be? But when you come to Jesus, he wants to transform you if you let him transform you, if you let his Holy Spirit work in you and through you. But, you know, I think some of us are like the old Christian song, I shall not be moved, I shall not be moved. We stand firm in our beliefs, and we don't want to be changed. We don't want to be transformed. Let the Holy Spirit work in you. Let him transform and change you. Because then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, and it's pleasing, and it's perfect. It's good, and it's pleasing, and it's perfect. A verse that's, one of my life verses is Matthew 6, 33, and they've got 33 and 34 up here. But seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. In DeYoung's book, Just Do Something, he says, the message of this passage couldn't be any clearer. Jesus does not want us to worry about the future. Worrying and fretting in the future, even if it's pseudo-holy worry where we think we're just trying to make sure it's exactly what God wants, really is not what God's looking for. It's not going to add one single hour to your life. It certainly will not add any happiness or any holiness either. Jesus doesn't treat obsession with the future as a personal quirk, but rather as an evidence of little faith. He says, and if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? Certainly hoping and praying that we don't hear that from our Lord. When we think about that seeking and pursuing, 
It's, De Young says, it's something that we're to run hard after him. Run hard. His commands and his glory. If any of you have played sports and athletics, when you go to do something, you want to run hard after it. You don't want to be looking to run for a touchdown in slow motion. Yesterday when the Bills got that interception and a 101-yard run back, that guy wasn't looking to run slowly. He's running hard for the other goal line. What goals are we running after and are we running hard after them? The question is really not so much, not that these aren't all important, but that's not the most important. Like, am I going to be a history major? Am I going to go to law school? Am I going to be a doctor, a nurse, a salesman? Am I going to be a coach? Am I going to live in New York, Massachusetts, Florida, South Carolina? Those aren't the big questions, although they can certainly be important. The big question is, do I love the Lord with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, and all my mind? That's the big question, Luke 10, 27. It's a second question that gets to the heart of God's will for our lives. Ask yourself that question. Think on that question. So, as we think about the second step in what we should do, continuing the case study, I began to meet with my wife when we were debating, do I do this or not do this? Do I pursue another opening if something comes up? I met... With Joey, I met with a couple of brothers from North Central. I talked to one of our pastors and began to discuss this, this whole situation because I wanted to weigh in the walk of wisdom by seeking counsel. I wanted to seek godly counsel. A key question to ask before you ever go to get counsel from someone and before you just quickly say, oh, yes, I'm always, I always seek godly counsel, think about this question as you listen to these scriptures. Is this truly me? Let the wise listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. Get all the advice and instruction you can so that you will be wise the rest of your life. Wouldn't you like to be wise the rest of your life? For some of the younger people here, boy, get wise early. I'll tell you, you'll avoid some mistakes. For some of you who are now more in the senior category, it's still, I want to finish strong. We talk about that all the time in our Encore group, finishing strong for Jesus. So I was reading, studying, and meditating on Scripture, step one. I was then seeking counsel from dear brothers in the Lord. And then step three, I wanted to walk in the way of wisdom by spending time in prayer. Joey and I were praying together. The men that I had met with to discuss were praying with me and for me. A couple of the brothers that I met with at church and one of our pastors were praying for me. I prayed by myself. The entire decision was surrounded by prayer. And, and you know, I, one piece I kind of left out. The week after all this stuff started, what happens? Two positions open up in Liverpool. One just under a mile from my house, one about three miles from my house. I interviewed for both. I get offered both, thank you, Jesus. And then the superintendent says, I'd really like you to go to Morgan because it's, you've got a little bit more experience and there's a few more issues and challenges there, but that's where your kids go, and if you don't feel comfortable, that's okay. So again, praying with the family, praying with our girls, made that decision to go to Morgan. But let me say this. Don't think when you think you're following God's decision that it's always going to be easy. Because I got there, and believe me, the first six months, 12 months, maybe 18 months, I'm going, oh my goodness, God, did I hear from you? What am I doing here? I had a great job at FM. This is really a challenge. There had been some issues, there had been some hurts, there had been some pain. But over time, God did a great work. And it began to be a great place for kids and a great place for teachers and a great place for parents. And we became a national school of character down the road, and, and the Lord just did a great work. But I got to be there for every one of my kids' concerts, band concerts, pre-quarter concerts, every science fair, every open house. I was there as a dad, and I was there as a principal. I didn't miss one of those evenings. I got to see them double, sometimes triple if we had to do two concerts or whatever. Didn't miss one. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that I was able to be there and not feel like I was missing something special in my kids' lives. As we pray, we pray for illumination. 
that God would open our minds so we can understand scriptures and we can apply them to our lives. Lord, keep us open. Make it clear to us. I want to always be open to your word. We pray regularly for wisdom. James 1.5 and many other places talk about the importance of wisdom. And we pray for things that you already know are God's will. In our Encore group, we talk a great deal about one anothering. There's all kinds of scriptural admonitions that say things like, love one another, encourage one another, bear one another's burdens, serve one another. And we look to do that, and we pray that as a group we will do that well. I got a beautiful note yesterday from Bill Doyle, one of our seniors. He gave me this beautiful note with prayers he wrote for me for today. He was praying for me. He was taking my burden and praying and that God would do a work today. We pray for the lost, because we know God came to seek and save the lost. So if he sends his son Jesus to die for us, we sure should be praying for those that don't yet know, know the Lord. We pray for our attitudes. We pray for our hearts to fall deeper and deeper in love with Jesus. We pray that we remain humble, teachable, and we would ask God to move in us and through us as we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Kevin DeYoung says this, and again, I, I'm a quote guy, as you might have guessed today, from all the quotes that have gone up. I love quotes. I can sit and read quotes just like I can read. That's why I like uh, greeting cards, I guess. I just love to read. But the way of wisdom is a way of life. If you're a person of prayer, full of regular good counsel from others and steeped in the truth of his word, you should begin to make many important decisions instinctively and some of them even quickly. Isn't that nice? We don't have to spend weeks and weeks and weeks on every decision. But as we're just regularly pursuing him, and he guides us and he leads us by his spirit. Why is all this so important? Well, back on September 1st, I've got my four grandkids at the house, and we decide to walk from my house in Iron, in, in, over in, on Millwood Circle, and and we're going to walk from there over to Bagelicious in the Bayberry Plaza. By the way, commercial for Bagelicious, great bagels. But, but um, we're going to walk over there with the four grandkids. And my youngest one, Caleb, he's actually second youngest, but he's five. He's a big football guy. He is a huge Bills fan. He can tell you every guy in the Bills roster at age five. I mean, he was just going crazy last night, jumping up and down when that interception was made. But... He says, Papa, can't we bring the football? And I said, honey, you know, we've only, we're going to be walking in the first couple of blocks. might be okay, but then it's going to get busy. And he's like, oh, Papa, Papa, please, can't we just bring the football? So, of course, Papa, soft heart, would have said to my own kids, probably, no, we're not going to do that. But, yeah, sure, honey, we can bring the football. So we start walking. And they decide they want to play keep away. And I've been a New England Patriots fan for a long time. No booing, no hissing. I'm very thankful for what the Bills are doing, but, I'm, but normally I'm rooting for the Patriots. So Caleb goes, Papa, we're going to all be the Buffalo Bills, and you're going to be the New England Patriots. And we're going to play keep away, the four of us against you. So they start throwing the ball, and Papa's, you know, I'm going, well, of course, these are only eight, nine-year-olds, and five and a half, six, I, Papa can get the ball. Well, my granddaughter, Della, puts the ball behind her like this, and I think I'm going to come up right behind her like a Statue of Liberty and just grab that ball right out of her hands. Well, I'd love to have a video of exactly what happened, but somehow she does a little pump fake, which I used to do when I played quarterback, but she gives me a little pump fake, and she pulls the ball down. And somehow Papa loses his balance. I'd love to have the video so I could show you instant replay, but I fall full out in the middle of the road and land on my right side on my ribs, and I do not catch myself one iota. Every ounce of this body smashes into the middle of the road. And I'm there going, can I breathe? Like, my grandkids are looking at me, they're going, Papa, Papa, should we call 911? I said, well, just give me a minute. Let's see if I can start to breathe again. Long story short, end up with a broken eighth rib, several other bruises and severe little things that are still not great right now, to be honest. But I'm thinking, you know, I took a dive into the middle of the street and broke a rib. And I've had some other bruises from that. But you know what? we got to be careful about not just physical falls. we got to be careful about lots of other kinds of falls. Because physical falls can obviously be serious. I sure wish I didn't fall that day. But there's so many other real dangers. They can cause pain beyond that of a broken rib. Things that we just don't see coming, just like I didn't see the fall coming. Like those relationship issues. You know, no one stands at the altar and says, I do, and then thinks so many times, months or years later, they're going to be saying, I don't. You know, and the pain and the hurt that goes along with that. Financial issues, it can go deep and can cause us all kinds of challenges. That's why God talks so much about finances in his word. It has great wisdom. Work challenges. 
may we allow him to work in us and through us for his glory and his honor. So we need to act because wisdom keeps you. In Proverbs 2, I'm just going to share these very quickly. But it keeps you from wicked men. It keeps you from dark days. It keeps you from crooked paths and adulterous women with her seductive speech. And it's the path of righteousness, while foolishness is the path of death. Closing thoughts. You'll say, Rich, it's about time. Come on, you got a little bit long-winded up there. Always dangerous to give me a microphone. Um, I spoke earlier about how we can get stuck, how we can get stuck in making decisions because we're distracted, because we're deceived, and how we often delay in making decisions because of over-spiritualizing, fear of getting it wrong, decision fatigue, etc. Well, for those of you who are Jesus followers, my prayer would be that you would not be distracted, you would not be deceived, you would not delay in making decisions that demonstrate your reverential love for our amazing Lord and Savior. Very simply, may we look to be God-pleasers and not man-pleasers because of our great affection for Jesus. For those of you listening today who maybe haven't made a decision, or some people here today who maybe haven't made a decision yet to follow Jesus. By the way, the single most important decision you'll ever make, the single most important decision you'll ever make to follow the Lord. But my prayer for, for you is this, that you wouldn't be distracted, you wouldn't be deceived, and you wouldn't delay in coming to God. Don't be distracted, don't, don't be deceived, and don't delay, but come to the Lord and let him begin to work in you and through you. Matthew 19, 14 says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. May we come to Jesus like my grandchildren come to their moms and dads with such reverential awe and such trust. Thank you.